In this video, we will start with a normal population of values with a mean value of 80 and a standard deviation of 2. And then we will use an Excel model to investigate taking a sample of five random values from this normal population and use those sample to estimate the true mean of this population. And we will compare the confidence deviation using the sample standard deviation with the confidence deviation calculated using the population standard deviation. We will start in cell D2 by randomly selecting a value from this source population. And to do that, we will use the function norm inverse, where we will use rand to generate a random probability for this selection. And then we will use the mean value from B2 and the standard deviation from B3. This generates a randomly selected value that will change every time we make a new entry into the spreadsheet or every time we press the function key F9. So every time we press F9, we generate a new value randomly selected from this normal population. And we will assume that this is an experimental measurement which can be made to an accuracy of one decimal place. So we will round our derived value just to one decimal place. And we will use this formula to generate five random values in column D and then subsequently to many other columns, but we want the reference to be specifically to the same cells B2 and B3, so we must lock both the column and the row number using dollar signs for both the mean and the standard deviation. So now we can copy this down and generate the first set of five randomly selected values. We now treat these as five replicate experimental measurements, and to get the best estimate of the true mean of the population, we take the mean of our sample by using the Excel function, average, and then identifying the cells holding the data. So the sample average of 80.02 is our best estimate of the true mean of the population. We now need to get a measure of the uncertainty in this estimate, which we can do by calculating the standard deviation of the sample, which we do in D9. And we will use the sample de standard deviation, standdev s, and again identify the range of values. It's a sample standard deviation of 1.65. So D8 is our best estimate of the true mean of the population. And the sample standard deviation is our best estimate of the true standard deviation of the population. For comparison, in D10, we will use the function standdev population for the same set of values. We have put this in italics because we, we would not normally take a population standard deviation of a sample. But we do notice that the population standard deviation gives a lower value than the sample standard deviation. The sample mean is our best estimate of the true population mean, but we now wish to calculate a confidence interval of that estimate. So we calculate the standard error, which is obtained by taking the sample standard deviation and dividing by the square root of the sample size which in this case is five values. And to calculate the confidence deviation, we need to multiply this by a T value. So we will use a T inverse, and we will use T inverse two-tailed because we want the two-tailed value. And for a 95% confidence interval, the appropriate probability is 0 0.05, and we want the degrees of freedom in this case, for this calculation, we had five bits of information to start with. And from five bits of information, we calculated a mean value. So we've lost one bit of information. So for the calculating the confidence interval, we now have 
four bits of information or four degrees of freedom left, giving it the t value. The confidence deviation is equal to the t value multiplied by the standard error. So the confidence deviation is the range on either side of our best estimate mean value that we can be 95% confident of finding the true population mean. In Excel, we can use an IF function to test whether our confidence deviation is a correct measure of the uncertainty. So for convenience, in B13, we will enter the known true mean of the population. So this is the value copied from cell B2. And then we will enter this IF function in cell D15. And we can see the IF function in the function bar. The IF function will return a 1 and identify a type 1 error if the true value, which is in B13, is greater than D8 plus D14, i.e. the mean value, plus the confidence deviation. So if the true value is more than a confidence deviation away from the sample mean, the IF function will record a type 1 error and will record a 1. It will also record a type 1 error if the true value B13 was less than the value of D8 minus this confidence deviation. So if the true value is more than one confidence deviation away from the mean value, it records a 1. Otherwise, it records a 0. So we enter. And in most cases, we record a zero, which shows that the mean plus or minus a confidence deviation does include the true value. But then if we were to press function key F9 several times, on some occasions, we may observe that the random generator records a type 1 error. And this means that the mean value of 79.04 plus a confidence deviation of 0.73 does not cover the value of 80. So the true value is outside our confidence interval and we record an error. We can also simulate this resampling process by copying this calculation to 2,000 columns. So we will repeat the whole test procedure 2,000 times by copying this data to column BYA. And we can see that most of the random calculations record a zero in row 15 to indicate that there is not a type 1 error. But as we scan through all the tests, occasionally we see this type 1 error indicated by the 1. And we can calculate the proportion of samples that have recorded a type 1 error by simply calculating the sum of the ones that have been recorded from D15 all the way through to BYA15 to give the total number of samples that have recorded a type 1 error divided by the total number of samples which was 2000 which has given us a proportion of 0 0.06. Statistically, we would expect a proportion of 0 0.05, but if we recalculate these values, we can see that, in fact, the proportion, although it varies between samples, varies around the expected proportion of 5% or 0 0.05. In B8, we can record the average of all the mean values in our 2,000 samples. And this is from D8 through to BYA8, giving an average value of 79.96 in this case, which is very close to the 80. Similarly, just by copying this average function down, we can see the average of the sample standard deviations is 
which is close to the population mean of 2. The calculation using the population standard deviation, however, gives a value which is considerably lower than the population standard deviation from which it was derived. So the best estimate for the unknown population standard deviation is actually the sample standard deviation value. We can also calculate the average standard error of the mean. And this gives a value in this case of 0.835, which is equal as expected to the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of 5. We now look at the calculation of the confidence deviation, assuming that we know the true standard deviation of the population. This is equivalent to an experiment where we know the experimental uncertainty of the measurement when we make these five measurements. So calculating this confidence deviation, we do not use the t-value, but we use the equivalent z-value for 95% confidence, which would be 1.96, which is multiplied by the standard deviation, which is known to be, in this case, 2 in B3. And because we will be copying this to the various columns, we'll put a dollar in front of the B to lock the column. And again, divided by the square root of the sample size, the number of measurements, which is 5. So this gives us the confidence deviation if we know the true standard deviation. And now we can enter a, a similar if formula to test whether this value of confidence deviation creates type 1 errors or not. And again, we normally see that there is not a type 1 error, but then if we repeat the sampling a sufficient number of times, we do find a type 1 error. It is also useful to investigate, as has happened in this case, whether a type 1 error occurs both for the confidence deviation using the population standard deviation, as well as the confidence deviation using the sample standard deviation. And so we, we will enter a test here to see whether the type 1 error has occurred in both forms of measurement. The if function here will record a 1 if both D15 and D18 are 1, so they add up to 2. And performing repeated samplings, we find an occasion where both confidence deviations using either sample standard deviation or population standard deviation both record a type 1 error. But there are examples where one method will record a type 1 error, but the other one does not. So to investigate this further, we will copy this calculation across to the 2000 samples. And we will calculate the proportions in the same way by copying this formula to B18 and B20. And so finally, we can see that the proportion of type 1 errors using the confidence deviation with sample standard deviation is about 0.05. And we get a similar proportion using the known sample standard deviation of close to 0.05. But the proportion where both simultaneously record a type 1 error is less, 0.034 which shows that there are a majority of cases where both methods record a type 1 error, but there are occasions where when you get a type 1 error using the sample standard deviation, and occasions where you get a type 1 error only using the population standard deviation. This graph shows the results from 8 of the 2000 samples. The range shown associated with each data point is the confidence interval using the sample standard deviation. And a type 1 error will occur if the true value of 80 falls outside that range. So we can see that sample S2 is a type 1 error because 80 is outside the range. And sample 8 is also a type 1 error. The 
confidence deviation using the population standard deviation is plus or minus 1.75. So we get a type 1 error using the population standard deviation if the actual data point falls outside these limits shown by these upper and lower lines. So in this case, S5 is a type 1 error for the population standard deviation, and so is S4. So if we look at S5, this has returned a type 1 error using the population standard deviation, but not using the sample standard deviation. S8 is the other way around. The type 1 error is for the sample standard deviation, but not the population standard deviation. S4, however, is a type 1 error for both the sample standard deviation and also the population standard deviation.